Well, good morning. My name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors this morning. I'm going to stay down here with you all so Luke doesn't have to move his stuff. Is that okay? It's all right if I hang out down here with you guys this morning. So if you grew up in the, if you were a teenager in the 80s and the 90s, you experienced a movie series called Back to the Future. Oh, I hear some gasps. <gasps> yeah. Remember a DeLorean that was created to be a time machine, flux capacitor, which makes time travel possible. Probably one of my favorite movie series of all times. I hope and pray that they never try to do a remake of it because they would just ruin it. But they did make a, a show that I saw this past week, and it talked about the effects that the movie had on our society. And I didn't watch all of it because I didn't quite believe that the movie itself could have affected our society in some of the ways that they thought of. But as I was preparing for this morning's message, which I've entitled Patient Endurance, it made me think, what if I could build a time machine? What if you could build a time machine? What if you could take a DeLorean? And I know this isn't a deep question. I know it's a silly question, but hang on. We'll get there, I promise. Where would you go? If you had enough uranium to make the time machine work, if you had the knowledge to make a flux capacitor and the miracle working power of an almighty God that would allow you to go back in time, where would you go? Where would you end up? What date and time, what part of history would you like to see actually played out physically in front of you. And I had to think for me, while I'm talking, go ahead and open to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to end up there in just a few moments. Um, I had to think that I would probably want to land somewhere in the neighborhood of Jesus having been resurrected, Jesus promising that if his followers, if his disciples go and pray, that the Holy Spirit that he promised would be released. I'd want to be in that time Period. I'd want to be in that, that those days in between Jesus ascending to heaven. I'd want to see that because that would be pr pretty cool and pretty amazing to see Jesus' last words here, which were go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'd want to hear and see that. I'd want to maybe, uh, like Doubting Thomas, I'd want to see the holes in his hands just to make sure, and I'd want to see him ascend. But then I'd want to be a part of that body of believers that got on their hands and faces before God. I'd want to be a part of that early moment in church history, that early moment when there was an anticipation of something great. There was an anticipation of something bigger than myself. There was an anticipation of God's promises becoming fulfilled and the power of God that he had promised so much actually happened. And I'd want to be there on the day of Pentecost. I'd want to be there. That would be the day that I definitely would want to see. I'd want to sense. I'd want to experience. I'd want to, I'd want to feel. I'd want to hear. I'd want to be a part of all of what we read in Acts chapter 2. And then I'd want to see and, and experience the amazement of the people around because it says that people of all race and, and nations, Jews and, 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 and those who had taken on Judaism, they were all there. Over a million people were probably in Jerusalem at that time, and something incredible was happening. Something powerful was happening. God was manifesting himself. He was providing power to his church. He was birthing, in a sense, the church. And then I'd want to hear Peter. I'd want to hear Peter get up and explain to those people who were amazed, to those people who were bewildered, to those people who were criticizing. I'd want to hear Peter physically explain that, and then I'd want to see the thousands. Matt, I see you back there. I'd want to see those thousands of people. I want to see those thousands of people. By the way, Matt Zara likes to poke his head out from behind the, the banner back there. I told him last week I saw him a couple times, and I'd call him out if he did it this morning. Anyway, thanks, Matt. Love you, man. Everybody give Matt a hand. He oversees our, our setup, and yeah, see, that's what happens, Matt. Love you, man. Appreciate you. But I'd want to I'd want to hear and see and experience the salvation of souls that happened on that day. I'd want to be a part of the power. And I want to be a part of the incredible moment in history 
Now, back a few years back, probably more in my 20s, there would have been some other moments. I, I love history, so maybe I would have gone back and seen some of the things that happened in our own American history, maybe gone back in to time, maybe seen Jesus' birth. But this week, as I was studying this passage that we're going to look at, I'd want to be a part of that moment. Because something powerful and something new and something fresh happened on that day through the release of the Holy Spirit on the church and on the believers. And out of that, out of that, believers were empowered, believers were gifted, believers were, were the manifestation of God was on the early believers to go. And they went back into their regions, they went back into their towns, they went back into their villages, all the way back to Rome. And it says in Acts 2 that there was a group of believers from Rome. There was a group of believers from Rome that were there that day. And then they went back. And I'd want to I'd wanted tell them, although I don't know that God would want me to tell them, I'd want to look at them and say, do you know what you're signing up for? Do you know that by professing Jesus Christ, what's going to happen to you? Do you know that, that by believing in Jesus Christ, as you go back to your villages, because you're, you're passionate and you're inspired right now and you're excited, but it's not going to be all that good for you. Things aren't going to go all that well physically for you. You're going to lose your lives. You're going to lose your homes. You're going to suffer for what you just, just gained excitement for. And there was, a, you read Acts chapter 2, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible, there is just this powerful move of God. And it needed to move that powerfully because of the persecution that these early believers were going to experience and the scattered moments that they were going to endure because of what they were giving their lives over to. And so fast forward a few years to the book of Hebrews. And as I studied the book of Hebrews, I want to give us just a quick backstory on this. Many biblical scholars believe that Hebrews might have been a sermon that was preached, not necessarily a letter that was written. A lot of the New Testament is letters that are written to the different churches by Paul throughout the region, to the Corinthians, to the Ephesians, to the Galatians, uh, <clears throat> to the Philippians, Philippians, excuse me. But they believe that maybe that maybe Hebrews was a sermon that was preached, and most likely it was preached in and around Rome. And there was about a million people in and around Rome. Rome had had reached the Ephesus or the the pinnacle of its culture, and it it was the largest the largest empire on the earth at the time. And they're estimating a million people would have been in and around Rome. And some of those believers, some of those believers on the day of Pentecost went back to Rome. And I can imagine their excitement because they felt something real. They felt something exciting. They were passionate about something they had believed in and heard about. And they had given their lives to. And something had happened. Something had happened. And so we're going to pick up in Hebrews chapter 10 starting with verse 32. They believe that the, the people group that the book of Hebrews was written to, the Jewish believers that were in and around Rome at the time, had become disheartened. Were beginning to turn away from what they had experienced or what they had been taught. And were beginning to fall back into regular society. And the writer of Hebrews or the sermon or the preacher of Hebrews, which some prescribe to actually being a woman, Believe it or not, some prescribe Hebrews to maybe being written or said by Priscilla, who we find in the book of Acts and a couple of other places throughout the New Testament. They're not saying 100% sure, they're just saying that some of it sounds like her. They really aren't quite sure exactly who might have written Hebrews and where and in what context it would have been said or it would have been written. But they do know this, it was an encouragement to believers who were falling away. It was an encouragement to believers who were who were second-guessing themselves. It was an encouragement to believers who were allowing culture to seep back into their belief system. But in Hebrews 10, starting with verse 32, it says, Think back. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and you were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew, you knew there were better things waiting for you that would last forever. 
So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember that the great will remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will receive you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. Notice that in the writers terminology you can tell that he's talking to a group of believers who may have been contemplating stepping back he's talking to a group of believers who must have been discouraged who had believed with all of their heart at one moment and he's encouraging them don't give up don't give up think back on those early days when you first learned about christ remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering And he begins to remind them, remember, sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and you were beaten. And sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. I'm thinking to myself, if I'm wanting to encourage you as a church body this morning to endure and to continue forward, I'm not sure I would remind you of the times that things didn't go so well in your belief system. But yet that's what the writer is doing here is saying, remember, remember back on those early days when you first learned about Christ in verse 37 he goes on to say for in just a little while the coming one will come and not delay and my righteous ones will live by faith but I will take no pleasure in anyone he turns away he's quoting Habakkuk 2 right there which by the way if you ever if you're ever wondering where our culture and our society and what God would say to it in this moment read the book of Habakkuk Habakkuk however you want to pronounce it it's a very truthful, very straightforward book in the Bible where the Lord was talking straight into the heart of Israel and where they were at at that time. In verse 39, he goes on to say, but we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, I just pray for a spirit of encouragement in this room this morning. Life throws so much at us. There's so much the enemy can throw to discourage or dishearten. And I pray, Lord, that as we dig deep into the passage, that we would remember, that we would define and we would allow. Hear our hearts this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. First and foremost this morning, the writer asks us to remember our beginning. Or he asks them to remember their beginning. Can anybody in here think back? Can you remember that first moment that Jesus Christ became real? Can you remember that moment where he became more than just a Sunday school lesson? More than just a a flannel graph that your Sunday school teacher or more more than just a sermon that you didn't quite understand because you were five or six or seven and sitting on a pew in your church? Do you remember the moment that it became more than just a lesson? It became real. It became a belief system. It became a part of you. It became who you are. It became who you are. Can you remember back to that day? I can. You've heard me say it before. I remember in the front bedroom of the youth house on Ashton Street at Ashton Mennonite when I was 17 years old. And the Lord finally got a hold of me and said, listen, I need you to accept me because I have created you, I have purposed you, and I need you. And I remember this is the first time that I ever felt needed in my life. I ever felt needed and I ever felt loved. And I remember coming out of the room that night and hugging my youth pastor and hugging some of the friends that had been praying over me. And Luke alluded to the fact that he was a new Luke in that moment. And I knew that I was a new Andy in that moment. And as I'm reading this passage, I had to think of my life the next few months. I didn't have to endure anything being taken away from me. I didn't have to endure persecution. I didn't have to endure ridicule. I didn't have to endure my home being taken away. And the writer is writing back to these very people, some of them who were a part of the day of Pentecost, to think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ because there's something there should have been something fresh and something new something there should have been a spark in you in that moment maybe you can resonate with this when you met your spouse your future spouse when you first saw those butterflies flying when you first saw you know you looked across the room and you made made googly eyes at who was going to be your spouse 
I can still remember the first moment I ever noticed Danielle. It's because she was asking the group of us at counselors that summer in camp to pray for a girl that had just gotten hurt. And she was calling the whole group of people to prayer. And I thought, huh, she's cute. It took her a little while to convince her that I was cute. But after many, many, many weeks of, of wearing her down, here we are today. I love you, honey. Think back. You know, this group of people, they endured public ridicule. They endured public ridicule. Like, as they went back into the Roman area, the area in and around the villages, the town of Rome itself, and they started to declare Jesus, it didn't sit so well. It didn't sit so well with, with many of the people around, and they would have been dragged out. They would have been dragged out into city squares. They would have been dragged out into public areas, and, and they would have been asked to denounce Christ. And at first, as I studied this, at first they weren't necessarily beaten. They were ridiculed. They were made fun of. They were fired from jobs. They were enslaved. They weren't necessarily physically beaten, but they were publicly ridiculed. They were spit on as they went down the streets because somehow, some way, people remembered who you were when you started talking about this Jesus from Nazareth. Eventually, they, were be, they began to put them in prison. And not prisons like, not prisons like we have today. A couple weeks, couple about a month ago or so, I went in with some of the Florida Revive guys, and we went into the Sarasota County Jail, and we spent the morning ministering to some inmates there. And I thought to myself, <laughs> this wasn't the type of prison that the early believers were put in. The one that really hit me hard that I didn't realize it was more of a subtle persecution that they went through is the Romans would literally confiscate your property. Now, they wouldn't throw you in jail. They wouldn't beat you. They just simply said, everything you own is now ours. You denounce Jesus, you keep it. You don't denounce Jesus, everything you own is now ours. And they would take you and they would sit you outside of your home, sit you outside of your property, and they would invite the community to come in and loot your property. And you would sit there and watch as maybe friends that you had weeks before that or people that you knew weeks before that would come into your property and take everything that you own. Burn your house, destroy your fields, take your livestock, totally loot you of everything that you owned, and then they would look at you and say, now you can follow Jesus. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is saying, think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. And I'm thinking, why would I want to remember that? Why would I want to go back to that? Because I believe the writer is speaking into their soul. I believe the writer is speaking outside of the physical realm into a spiritual realm that sometimes we forget about in the church and our culture. I think he begins to speak into and, and, and wants to help them to, define, to redefine their joy, which would be the second point this morning is define your joy. Define your joy. In verse 34, he says, you suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. How do you get to that place? How do you get to a place of, of accepting the fact that everything is, that was yours a few moments ago has now been looted and taken from you, and you accepted that with joy? You accepted that with joy because you knew there were better things waiting for you that would last forever. You knew there were better things waiting for you that would last forever. You know, as a youth pastor, I couldn't promise teenagers a whole lot when they were going through relationship issues or going through struggles or this or that. And you remember back to your teenage years and some of the things that mentally and socially, some of those struggles. And I re Probably the advice I gave to teenagers more than anything as a youth pastor says, I can't promise you a whole lot, but what I can promise is you won't be a teenager the rest of your life. Like you remember as a teenager being 16 years old, you felt like you were going to be 16. Some of you in the room, you're 16. You feel like you're going to be 16 your entire life. I tell you the truth. I'm 45 years old and every year feels like a week to me now. 
Like it feels like time just won't stop. But I, you remember back then, it felt like time would just creep along because you wanted your driver's license, because you wanted the freedom to leave the house without having to tell mom or dad everywhere you were going and when you were going to be back. And it felt like you were encapsulated and controlled. Right? Amen? Some teenagers are really nodding their heads right now. And I would say the same thing to us. I can't promise you a whole lot here on earth. I can't promise that you won't go through trials. I can't promise that you won't go through tough situations. I can't promise that you won't go through circumstances or, that are tough. But what I can promise is if you believe in Jesus Christ with all of your heart, surrender your life to him, call him Lord, this is but a glimpse. This is but a glimpse of what we will receive. And the early believers at one point knew that. You knew there were better things waiting for you that would last forever. I read an article this week called The Essence of Evil. The Essence of Evil. At first I thought it was kind of a book. But it was just this article and it was talking and describing the, or answering the question, what is evil? What is the utmost evil act or the utmost evil presence that can be in our world. And, and I started thinking through different things as I began to read the article. And, and then the, the writer of the article began to explain that we start thinking of the Hitlers. We start thinking of the Stalins. We start thinking of pharaohs. We start thinking of, of evil men and women throughout our society. And he begins to explain that those are the manifestations of an evil. The manifestations of an evil. In fact, the most evil act that probably has ever happened on earth was by two people that were the closest to God that two people would ever have here on earth, and that would be Adam and Eve, because the most evil act that could have happened was turning their back on God. The most evil act that a nation, the most evil act that a person, the most evil act that we can do is to turn away from God. And you might sit here this morning and say, well, I'm a good person, even if I don't know God, and that is... That's true. Maybe you are. But see, we define good and evil by actions, not by God. The only thing good in the room this morning, ultimately good, is God. The only thing ultimately good is God. And the most evil thing that we could do is turn our backs on him. And they did that. When Adam and Eve decided, I'm going to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat from the tree that, that God told me not to. They made a decision that their way was better than God's, and it separated us and it allowed evil to enter into the world. In Jeremiah 2, verse 13, God is speaking through the prophet of Jeremiah to his people, the nation of Israel. He says, for my people have done two evil things. My people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. My people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. In Nehemiah chapter 8, we see that Nehemiah had, was burdened for the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel had been taken captive, and there was a remnant of people that had stayed in and around Jerusalem that weren't taken captive, and he found out they were living there, and so he goes back and helps them rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, which was a symbolism of God restoring his people. And it says in Nehemiah 8, verse 10, it says, he says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And they had spent most of the morning, actually from about sunup till about noonish, reading from the law the book that they had found as they were rebuilding the walls and, and had spent a good part of the morning on their faces before God and repenting before God. And their strength was returned to them because of their return to God. The nation of Israel had turned its back on God and they had spent the morning realizing that they had done that and they had spent a good bit of time that day repenting and because of that, their joy was returned. Their joy was returned. And so when I say define your joy, when define your joy in our society, we can begin to think about what makes us happy. And there's a thread of belief in our, in our society that as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else and makes ourselves happy, then it's okay. And that's a lie. That's a lie. Because if my joy is defined by my happiness or defined by what makes me happy, 
There are certain things in this world that make me happy that diminish my joy. There are certain things, let me say that again, there are certain things in this world that make me happy but diminish my joy if I'm not careful with them. You guys know I love Chick-fil-A. Makes me happy, but too much of it makes me larger, which makes me unhappy. You guys know that I love football. And I love to sit in my recliner and I like to watch football. It makes me happy. But too much of it will diminish the joy inside of me because I've neglected my Heavenly Father. Happiness can diminish your joy if you're not careful. And if the joy of the Lord is our strength, then that literally means that our faces need to be forward towards the Lord. In everything that we do, we need to rely on him for our dependency. He needs to be Lord of everything. And I know that that's not an easy thing to do. I wish I could stand here before you and say, I have this one conquered, but I don't. There are certain things that give us happiness for a moment. And when I hear about missionaries and I hear about martyrs and I hear about people who have given their lives ultimately for the Lord, inside of me, I, I would love to be able to, to, to tap into their soul and see what made them tick inside and what gave them true joy. I dare say that in our society, the things of the Lord don't necessarily give us joy like they used to. Reading our Bibles and spending time in community and prayer and worship don't necessarily return to us. And if the joy of the Lord is our strength, then that means that he's got to be the focal point. He's got to be Lord of even all of those things. Finally, I believe that the writer of Hebrews is calling them back to allowing their confidence to grow. In verse 35 and 36, it says, So do not, do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. Somewhere, if you're taking notes, I need you to write the word discipleship. Discipleship. Underneath it, I want you to write the word enrichment. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Allow your confidence to grow. I felt like the Lord encouraged me this morning to hit hard or, or to point out, I shouldn't say hit hard, point out that his desire is that we continually grow in him. Like the process of discipleship for every single person in this room does not end until our final moment here on earth, and then we get to be with him for eternity. And that discipleship of ourselves and discipleship of, our, of others around us need to be a focal point again. We need to allow our confidence through discipleship in Christ, through community and through others, to allow us to grow and trust Every day or every week, I hear reports of, of different things that are under attack. And, in, and in, I, I will say it's great to have a, a president that is fighting for some of those things. But his time in office is going to come to an end. And the Bible is very clear about end times. And I'm afraid for where the American church lies right now in our confidence and trust in the things of the Lord. Let me back up and say that differently. I'm actually concerned about the church and our culture and its confident trust in the Lord. Because so many things, so many things take importance over Him. So many things take precedence. And we are okay with that. I don't know how many times this week I tried to encourage people, you know what, it's okay, it's okay. And, and on the way home from a meetup, 
the Lord just really hit me hard and said, is it okay? Like the writers of Hebrews, he wasn't okay or she wasn't okay with what was happening to the Hebrew culture in and around Rome. He wasn't okay with that. And he was encouraging them to step up and to grow and to allow their joy to be set back in their heavenly father to remember Jesus, to remember the beliefs that they held true to. Remember, I, I, some of those that were at the day of Pentecost, I'm thinking that they're thinking back, oh man, you know what? I remember that day when the Holy Spirit was released in me and I've allowed that to go cold. I've allowed that to go numb. I'm thinking back to Nehemiah as they read from the book of the law and the church was remembering, oh wow, we have turned our backs on God. We have turned away from God. It's time to refocus on God. And they got on their faces and they repented before God. And then I look at our culture and I look at our churches, not just us, and I look at myself. And I'm not saying that 24-7 you need to lie on your carpet and your face before God. What I'm saying is as a church, we need to begin to repent, not just for ourselves, but for our churches. That we grow in confidence and trust in the Lord again. Someone asked me this morning what I think the ultimate, because they had heard, they had gotten wind of, because I had asked the question earlier in the week of the essence of evil, and they, I didn't quite have the whole answer at that time, and they asked me, so what is, what would you think, Andy, what would you say the most evil act you could do is? I said the most dangerous act, I don't know if it's the most evil, but the most dangerous act is I could say that there is no God and walk away. But I know, church, hear me, I know that I do that with my actions time and time and time again. When I choose myself. The Bible says that we should have no other gods before him. And in that time period, there was actual physical gods, poles, shrines, temples that were set up to other gods. So this one doesn't hit us as hard. But what if our gods look like TVs? What if our gods look like workplaces? What if our gods look like ourselves? What if our gods look like fishing poles? What if our gods look like boats? What if our gods look like the newest car, the newest cell phone? What if our gods are church buildings? Have no other gods before me. The joy of the Lord is our strength, and when we begin to return to him being the focal point. See, to me, the answer for depression and the answer for a lot of our mental issues in our time period, we're, we're a nation that has so much, but yet depre the depression rate grows. The drug use rate grows. Suicide rate grows. Why is that? Because our joy is placed in the wrong thing. So you jump to Hebrews chapter 11, which, we, which is a chapter that's known as the great hall of faith. And all these men and women are being notarized. Noah, a Abraham, Moses, Rahab, Esther, the nation of Israel, all of them are being noted for their great faith. And in Hebrews 11, 13 and 16, it says, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. Here's a crazy thing. They did not receive what was promised as far as earth is concerned. But they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place. The Abrahams, the Noahs, the Moseses, the Rahabs, the Joshuas, the Esthers. Many times throughout history, the nation of Israel but they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Worship team, if you would come on back up. As they come, I ask you this question. In verse 16, it says, they were looking for a better place. Are 
are we looking for a better place this morning, church? Are we longing for a better place? Our oldest son is in his senior year of high school, and so we're putting plans together and seeking Lord and, and thinking through what next year looks like for him for college. Many of you have done this with your own sons and your own daughters. It's but a glimpse, but a blip. You think of all the people that have come before us. You think of all the people that have lived and have done great things. You think of Noah. You think of Abraham. You think of Esther. If we could create that time machine out of that DeLorean and we could go back and visit each of them and the choices they made, the things that they gave up, the things that they sacrificed. At some point in time, we're going to get to spend eternity with those men. You think of the Pauls. You think of Peter, you think of John, you think of the early church, the church in, of Pentecost. You think of everything that they gave up in the little blip of, of time on the timeline that they lived in. And if we could have a conversation in the spiritual realm with them right now, what would they say to us? I guarantee you, I promise you, that every one of them would say, there is nothing worth giving up. There is nothing worth giving up to gain what we are experiencing in eternity right now. Those men have lived, they've created a legacy, and they've moved on. Church, we will live. We have but a blip here in the year 2020. Just a dot, a speck on the timeline of time. And what we live for in that speck what we die to in that speck, what we surrender in that speck, is what matters for eternity. They were looking forward to a country that they would call their own. They were looking forward to an eternity that God had promised them. They were looking for a better place. They were looking for a heavenly home life. And that, will, that is why God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. So this morning I ask, if you would close your eyes with me. I know I make you do this a lot. But I'd ask you to ask the Holy Spirit, what is he saying to you this morning? Maybe the Holy Spirit's taking you back to a beginning where things were fresher, things were new. I think God would remind you this morning that He hasn't changed since that time. He hasn't moved since that time. You're the one that's changed. You're the one who's new. The thing that I gathered from this passage the most was it was a calling back to. The Lord had revealed Himself to the church, to the Hebrews. The Lord had revealed himself to, so much so that they were willing to give up everything that they owned. They were willing to, ridic be, to undergo ridicule. But something had happened. Something had changed and it wasn't God. It was them. So church, is it time we repent? Is it time we allow the Holy Spirit as he did in the book of Nehemiah, as Ezra read from the scrolls and the Israelites realized we had turned our back on God and what was their action? They turned and got on their face before God and repented and declared their need once again for Him. Church, it's time for us to begin to declare our need for Him. He's King of our hearts of our minds and king of our souls. And anytime we choose something else other than God, it diminishes our joy. And if our joy is our strength, that's why you're unhappy. That's why you're battling loneliness. Because the joy of the Lord has been diminished by you fulfilling or trying to fulfill your own desire for happiness in other things. So I invite you this morning to respond in whatever way 
the Lord is calling you to respond. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit. Maybe there's something in your heart that you realize it's caused me to turn. It's caused me to be distracted. You respond in the way that the Holy Spirit calls you to respond. And I would pray and I hope all week long I've been praying and hoping for repentance. For a spirit of repentance in this room. And know this, repentance doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad person. It just means you're a distracted person in some way, shape, or form. And I would invite you, if you're in the room this morning, you've never felt that freshness. You've never felt the love of God. There's a quickening in your spirit right now. I would say that that's the Holy Spirit. As Peter had to explain that on the day of Pentecost, that's the Holy Spirit of God wanting to take up residence in your heart. with your mouth and declare that he is God and surrender your life to him and it'll change everything so Holy Spirit this morning as we declare you king of our hearts that you are a good good God and that we need you as we declare the promise that you're never going to let us down Holy Spirit speak to our hearts move us spiritually move us physically if that's what needs to take place But may nothing hinder us from turning our hearts, our souls, our minds, our eyes, our bodies physically back to you this morning. And I repent of the church of our country. I repent right now for myself and for Bayshore Church and for the Church of Sarasota, the Church of Florida, the Church of the United States of America, that you would begin to call us back us back to seeking your face and desiring you, you being the strength. Return to us the joy of our salvation. Create in us clean hearts this morning. Renew right spirits within us. Take not thy Holy Spirit from us. King David knew what it meant to be separated from God and he cried out, don't. He cried out, I, I can take any other I can take any other form of punishment, but do not allow me to be separated from you. Bring us back to you. Turn our faces back to you as we declare you king of our hearts this morning. Church, all I ask is that you listen to the Holy Spirit.